Hey guys, we're going to go ahead and start in on chapter one. Um, you're catching me at home doing this lecture, so uh, not quite dressed quite as nice as I would be at work. But in any event, I just wanted to go ahead and get chapter one rolling. Um, I know people normally jump out pretty good at the beginning of the semester, so I want to get y'all on a good start. What I'm really going to emphasize and re-emphasize is you are covering a full semester's worth of material in eight weeks. And it's really seven weeks because that eighth week is only the final exam. So we are fixing to fly through some material. It's like you need to put in basically double the classwork for us to be able to do this. So I, I just want you to try your best at establishing a real pattern of you know checking in and doing the work in this class even more than once per week or else you're not gonna be able to keep up. And you've gotta be able to keep up because like we're we're going to you're going to be ready for your first test on three chapters by next week. That's how fast this is going to move. So I'm going to jump in. Everybody usually starts out pretty good. We're going to go ahead and jump in on chapter one. Um, now, each week I will have a PowerPoint that. Um, let me find it. <laughs> Here it is. I'll have a PowerPoint and I will post that as a separate link. So you have a link to this lecture, which obviously you've opened if you're seeing the lecture. You will also have a link to the PowerPoint. So you can always come back and review it quickly as you get ready for a test. All right, let's jump in because the first chapter is actually a fun chapter. Um, it's really looking at why are we studying criminal justice? Well, and hold on here, I think I have the wrong. Here we go, so I'm sorry about that. Um, why are we studying criminal justice? What's the point of this? Well, the point of it is we are all affected by the criminal justice system. I mentioned it in the introductory um, video that I did that, you know, at some point, maybe already, but surely in the future, you will be touched by the criminal justice system. And that hopefully is something as simple as a speeding ticket or a parking ticket. Hopefully it is, maybe you get a summons to come participate as a jury member. Um, hopefully it's not that you are actually charged with a crime and become a defendant within the system or maybe a family member. Um, but it's all over the news and it has been now for several years. And it's really been one of the hottest topics around. You will hear a lot of names and, and some of this, some of you probably consider kind of old news now, but for that reason, you may not remember some of these people, but you know, things kind of all came to a head a few years back with several particular cases that really caught national attention. And so what I've done here is pull out little YouTube snippets to kind of remind you who these people were because we may listen to somebody say, you know, out chanting Michael Brown or Eric Garner. You need to know what happened to Michael Brown and Eric Garner and some of the other cases that we're gonna go through. I'm not gonna stop in this lecture and, and sit here and watch the YouTube video with you. I'm gonna assume you're in college, you'll stop and watch the YouTube. None of these YouTube snippets that I have put here are more than a couple of minutes long, and they will really bring you up to speed on these particular people. But Ferguson, Missouri was one of the, the hottest places that came to light initially. And there was really a lot of um, fallout or results of what happened in Ferguson far beyond even what the general public knows. And, and what I mean by that is obviously it brought the treatment by police of um, people of color, people who are in, um, already uh, or should I put, not in a position to endanger police, but who perhaps were killed or injured themselves. And so it, you know, it became this mistreatment type deal. We don't trust the police. All those issues have been out there for years, for several years now. But in Ferguson, they arrested a ton of people. Well, guess what? A lot of those people couldn't pay their fines. And so now they're staying in jail because they can't pay their fines. Well, that little issue alone had widespread, widespread impacts on even places as far down here where we have um, agencies, we have um, nonprofit corporations, and even our own higher courts 
who are dealing with what do we do with people who don't have the money to pay their fines? Do we just keep them locked up forever? So it seems like a totally separate issue, you know, as far as paying fines and, and incarceration, but it, yet it came from the Ferguson case and Michael Brown. So I'm going to encourage you to go back and see who Michael Brown was on this little snippet. Go back and see who Eric Garner was. They're going to show you video of what happened to these people and why they became a national focus. But what you probably do somewhat remember, even though some of you are, are young, protests and rioting and looting and and you know it was it was um, the response to all of these cases of mistreatment of people and. What that resulted in even was police were afraid to make arrests because of what might happen during the course of the arrest. So it really became a dangerous situation out there for both sides, you know, for the people who were out doing the protesting. Now, you know, you got that side of it is, OK, well, everybody has the right to protest. Right. But rioting and looting, you don't have the right to do that. And what good does that do? Does that really work on the issue that you think you're, or, or that you, uh, you know, in my mind, you pretend to be hiding behind? But it turned around the other way because there's a YouTube snippet here in December of 2014 where two New York police officers were murdered sitting in their car. And it basically was a result of the earlier cases where the police had killed the, I want to keep saying defendant, they're not really a defendant, they're someone that they were trying to arrest um, or who had stopped, let's put it that way. So everyone felt, and I say everyone, almost everybody felt that there was really a fundamental um, sense of injustice, that the justice system had been tainted and was no longer just meaning across the board to everyone. And it, it's been an issue and it's still an issue. And just in case you want to think, yeah, well, she's talking about all those national cases that happened in New York. No, not here. Um, no, it happened here. And these two, I think, are very important for you to watch. The first one is um, a snippet about Alton Sterling. And he was a gentleman who was killed up in North Baton Rouge by the police. The second one is uh, there was a man who came, I think he was from Dallas, on a Sunday morning who came to Baton Rouge and shot and killed three police officers and gravely wounded another who just, I think last year finally died. Uh, and so there was a police shooting and it, he, you know, it was in revenge of the earlier cases. So it's right here. It, it's right here too. It's everywhere. These issues of, you know, police versus we, we want them there to catch the bad guys, but we need them to catch the bad guys the right way kind of thing. And so it's a very hot topic. And to me, this type of information, this is so much more real life, you know, practical every day. You're going to see it. You're going to hear it than, than your math class or, you know, your biology class. Don't get me wrong. I used to be a math teacher, so I'm all about math. But this is more almost like a current events. Um, type situation because all of these snippets that I've put in here, you're going to see they're within the last eight to 10 years, all of them, some of them much more recently than that. And it's not been fixed. It hasn't been fixed. And some of you are the ones who need to fix it. You're the ones that are going to come through and have the ideas to reach out to both sides and be able to bring them back to the table and, and, and help things get better. So that's why I think it's so important. Again, two more names that you will hear people talk about. And I just wanted you to have access to what happened to these people. In Breonna Taylor's case, she was in her apartment. The police came and, and were serving what they call a no-knock no warrant, where they can just bust up in there. And they thought the boyfriend had a gun and they started shooting and they killed Brianna Taylor. Ahmaud Arbery was that gentleman. You may have seen that one. He was jogging in the neighborhood in Florida and some of the neighbors climbing a truck and go down and shooting. And they were found guilty at trial. But again, a lot of times it is the treatment of the police of a particular individual a lot of it turned into racial issues and we can't get around that, nor should we try to get around it if it's the issue. 
So, you know, Ahmaud Arbery was a black man who was killed by some white men. And it all of a sudden became, you know, a racial issue because those white men, they weren't even arrested for quite a while, as I recall. So we've got real life issues that are hot topics that touch everybody's buttons. And you need to be aware you need to be intelligent in your arguments. I think everybody has the right to have a position to participate in discussions. But I, what I want you all to be is intelligent in the facts. You know, if you're going to take a position, then then it's because you've thought through all the sides of it, gathered the facts and reached that position to just fire off from a gut feeling without really understanding, that's that's really not helpful. And in my mind, I've always been one who, it's very easy to sit back and complain about the way things are done, but it's very important to have an alternative way for them to be done. So just to say the system is broken is not good enough. You have to be able to go a step further and say, here's how we can fix it. This is how we can try to move forward. And that's why we study criminal justice. We've got to know the system to know how to keep it working well. Is it a great system? Absolutely. Is it a perfect system? Absolutely not. Does it need fixes? Absolutely. And so I'm hopeful that some of you, even if you don't go into a criminal justice field, which I hope some of you will, that could be law, it could be law enforcement, it could be, you know, on the, the jailing end of it, that time, you know, it, it, it could be anywhere in the loop. Um, but even if you're not, and you're just Joe Blow, general citizen who's working at whatever job, you're still going to be a voter. You still need to be a voter who, who intelligently votes, who makes your decisions based on facts and information. Um, so anyway, kind of off on a little soapbox there. But of course, the one that everyone seemed to, to really, it was, I don't know, I kind of say it was the straw that broke the camel's back. But George Floyd, and I put some snippets here. If you have not seen the videos of this one, it is quite troubling where the police officer had him on the ground, put his knee on his neck and held him there and he died. I mean, there's no, I don't know how any other way to say it. You just have to say it. And he was found guilty. So he is in prison now serving his time. But this is, and of course it was a white police officer and it was a black, Mr. Floyd was black. So again, we had the racial tie into it as well as police officer versus citizen. So very important that you just check these snippets out. It won't take you long um, to, to really understand what a hot topic it is and how much it really does affect all of us in our day-to-day -day lives. Now, the good news is studying criminal justice is, I love it. I think it's fascinating. I think you will find it fascinating. But whenever you study something, and especially if you think you want to be in a position to improve it, you have to go back and see how did we get here? Where have we come from? so that we can turn around and look and say, okay, this is, the, this is where we need to go from here. So in studying um, criminal justice, you have to look at a history of it. Now, I, I, have the, uh, I have a hard, they give me a paperback book that I'm looking at. So I'm hoping my page numbers are exactly the same as yours. On page five, they have a chart that lists all of these years and these highlights of what happened in these years. So um, this is going to be important for one of your tests. Uh, hint, hint, you're going to see this again. So let's go back and look from 1850 through 18, about 1880. We had a crime epidemic and that was due to so much immigration and the Civil War. You know, I tell people in my classes, if any of you have ever watched uh, Gone with the Wind, great movie, great movie, long movie, but great movie, old movie. Um, when they come back to their plantation after the war, um, nobody has anything. Everything's been destroyed. There are no crops growing anymore. All the animals have been killed and eaten. 
And it, it really, you know, people were having to, to do whatever they could to survive. So crime was up and that's why it was up because there was just nothing for anybody to have. They were scraping from the dirt, literally trying to make enough to survive. By 1920 through basically 1933, now we're going to have widespread organized criminal activity. And this is when you hear the mob. When you hear about the mob, it came about because of prohibition. And for those of you who don't know what, what that was, but it was a, there was a time period during these years where the government decided that alcohol will be banned. We're not, alcohol, you can't buy it. You can't sell it. You can't go into a restaurant and drink it. it it's prohibited. That's why it was called prohibition. Well, needless to say, Americans are going to get their alcohol. And what happened was, is this black market, so to speak, rose up through organized criminal activity. And that's where you had what, what we well, was that was the bootleggers, the one who managed to get the illegal alcohol to the people, to the places and all to drink. And it was organized. That's when organized crime really got organized and grew was to deal with the, the alcohol distribution. Now, World War II came along and finished. And after that, crime rates remained pretty stable through 1960. Now remember, when when war when the wars really one, but mainly two ended, um, the country's happy. Everybody's children are coming home, their husbands are coming home, you know, they're not, they're not, their sons are not having to enlist and go fight. Everybody's happy at the end of a war. And so happiness means less crime. So crime, right, crime rates really didn't rise during this time period. But by the time we got to the 60s and 70s, that's when the civil rights movement came about. And civil rights meaning up until that point, there were people of certain colors, there were certain genders, be it women, there were certain uh, religions who didn't have the right to do things that white men had the right to do. And by the 60s and 70s, that's when Martin Luther King, um, you know, the, the civil rights where they were marching to get the right to vote. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know how much a young person is exposed to that growing up. I mean, as far as studying history, I hope that you have had some but civil rights, basically, if you look at it, means I'm going to stand up and say, I have the right to do whatever it is. I have the right to vote. I have the right to go to the same school as the other person. And that's looking at me individually. So it's an emphasis on my individual rights. Well, guess what? When I'm focused on me individually, I'm much more likely to report crime against me. Whereas before, if I felt defeated, nobody's going to listen to me. It's just a bunch of old white men. They're not going to believe what I say. I'm not even going to report the crime. So from the 60s to the 70s, when the whole country became focused more on individual rights and standing up for those individual rights, there was a dramatic increase in reported crime. By the 1980s, now we've got the war on drugs. And that's when Reagan, President Reagan appointed a drug czar and it really drugs became the, the evil that we all needed to defeat to beat crime. Crack came about during this time. So large cities became havens for gangs, um, increased crime, decreased property values, all because of the battle with the emergence of crack and, and, and the drugs and their results. By the 1990s, we have several different major crimes and some of these are fascinating to me and we will spend a little bit of time talking about them. The 1990s, you know, it points out that the perception of crime, the, per, the public perception is that crime is increasing. But what some of you may not remember, and this is a shame because I'm getting too old because I do remember it, we didn't always have cable TV and we didn't always have news on 24 hours a day. But around this time in the 90s, we started having that. So 
you know, I, I often tell the story that my mom is 96 years old in an assisted living. And whenever I go see her, obviously that building is filled with old people, right? They, they need some help. And most of them are sitting in their room and they have their TV on, but they have their TV on a news station and I'll pass by morning or afternoon or night and it's always on that station. So they're always watching the news, which is of course reporting crime. So by the end of the day, when they've had that TV on all day, Lord, that's all they've seen all day long is reports of crime. That might have been the same crime and the same news story playing over and over and over. But from their point of view, Lord, there must be a lot of, a lot of crime must be increasing because I see it all day long on my TV. Well, that's public perception. That doesn't necessarily mean that it was. However, there were several high... Um, highly public, uh, things that we hadn't seen up to then. In 1995, Timothy McVeigh um, did the bombing of the Oklahoma City building. I will have, we'll talk about that one a little later when we talk about police work, but it, you can Google that and you will see just devastate. He, he drove a U-Haul truck up in front of a governmental building in Oklahoma City and he blew, I mean, this is a big old tall governmental building, he blew the whole front half of it off. The bottom floor was a nursery for the workers. I mean, it was terrible, just terrible. So obviously it killed, I don't remember the number right now, we're gonna look at it later, but killed a ton of people. Um, and that was the kind of thing we really hadn't seen until that point. In 1999, the Columbine High School massacre occurred. And I will always remember this one because it, it must have been in mid to late April because my youngest child was born April 2nd of 1999. And I can remember still being home with him, you know, as, as a newborn um, and watching the news stories on this. And this was in Colorado, it's right outside Denver. I actually went to the school, just drove by it. My daughter played softball. Um, and played in Denver this was several years back because she is older now. And we just wanted to go see the school because we had seen it on the news so many times. But basically two guys in their trench coats went into their high school and just blew people away. And up and nowadays, y'all are just immune to like, it, oh, another school shooting. But at that time, we'd never heard anything like that. That was a new thing for the country to experience. And then, of course, came September 11th. If you are not familiar with what happened on September 11th, then you are missing a huge chunk of American history. It was, you can't, and I don't know what the age cutoff would be, but I can tell you that those of us who were adults when this happened, I bet you almost everyone, if you ask them, where were you on September 11th, they'll remember. They'll remember exactly where they were. I do. I remember getting to the, I had a private law practice at the time in Gonzales. I remember getting there. Another attorney was in there and his secretary walked in a little while after me and said, hey, a plane hit the World Trade Center. And I'm like everybody else, I hadn't seen anything. Um, we just figured it was a little private plane that, you know, something broke on it and it flew into the World Trade Center. Well, when one of the attorneys came in a few minutes later, um, after the second one had hit, it's like, oh no, this is something major. Well, we didn't have any TVs at this law office. Remember, this is 2001, so you couldn't just turn on a computer and watch TV like you could today. What we did have, it's in an old house, what we did have was a radio that had an intercom to it. So we could turn on the news on the radio, we could hear it in every room. And I'm telling you, we really felt like, and I think people would tell you this, we're being attacked. Like there, we're fixing to have bombs dropping on us or something because we are being attacked. It was the scariest feeling in the world. And, and I can remember, and I'll take this to my dying day that I'm sitting at my desk and one of the other attorneys who practiced in the building was a retired military man. He's even older than me. And um, they, they'd come on the news and they were, they'd already Obviously, the two had already hit the Twin Towers. The other one had already hit the Pentagon. Um, but they had one that came on and said, there's one plane that's still up in the air. 
And he, without hesitation, said, we have to shoot it down. And y'all, this is a passenger plane that the U.S. military thought it was going to have to shoot down. Amazing, just amazing. Now they didn't because those passengers are the ones that took control and the plane crashed in Pennsylvania and didn't hurt anybody. But, um, you know, it's it just an amazing, I'm fascinated when you, when you get to September, which we're almost there, you know, next month, September 11th, the anniversary, a couple of those TV stations on cable will put on documentaries about September 11th. And I'm telling you, it is worth the time to watch some of them. There's one, every single airplane across the entire country was grounded. Every single airplane. They were landing all over the place, wherever they could get through to land. They shut down airspace that day. And the one, the documentary that talks about that is absolutely fascinating. Um, you know, what, how, how these planes all got down, where they got down. There's another documentary that follows President Bush. And if you've ever seen the video, he was actually in an elementary classroom in Florida visiting while they read a book and you see the gentleman his his aide or his assistant or whatever come over and whisper something in his ear and what he was whispering was you know we're under attack we've been attacked at the world trade center and and president bush is in front and you see him he's just nodding and he's he's you can see he's thinking but he didn't want to upset all these children right so he got up and they immediately you know rushed him to the airport well then what do you do with the president you can't bring him back to to washington dc they're being attacked with planes. You don't know what ne what's coming next. In fact, they were scared to put him up in the air. What if they have other planes that are going to get him in the air? It's really fascinating. And I'm kind of a September 11th um, freak, so to speak, in, um, you know, and just learning all that information. So that's really interesting. But in the history of it, that was a major change because um, it made crime global. Those guys came from another country and came over to our country. So now all of a sudden, we're not just focused on our country. This could come from anywhere. By the early 2000s, things kind of shifted more to corporate type crimes. And those are called white collar crimes. You may have heard people refer to white collar workers or blue collar workers. White collar, meaning they're wearing the nice white dress shirt that everybody used to wear in offices and all. And so it's the more business type um, crimes with stockbrokers who are, you know, illegally dealing and, and have information on stocks. From 2012 to about 2017, um, actually, I think now your book, this chart now changed it to 19. Um, there was an epidemic of mass shootings um, all over the place. We'll look at some of them in the next, by next week, when we start looking at, at serial killers and mass killers. But that's pretty much the stuff that you're accustomed to. No big deal. Somebody pulled out a gun and shot a bunch of people at a mall. Well, you hear that just about every day now. Well, that's when it really took off was back from 12 to about 19. And then they put from 2020, I'll have to update my PowerPoint here. From about 2020 present, cyber crimes become really popular. And of course, cyber crimes would be anything tied to a computer. So all of the hacking, all of the malware, you know, everything tied to a computer has really taken off because computers have really taken off. I mean, that's that's kind of a no brainer is we are we live much more in a computerized world than we did before. All right. Um, so one of the things that you will continue to hear throughout this course, because the book is designed this way, is two perspectives of the criminal justice system. And there are people all the way to one side and people all the way to the other side, but most of us are somewhere in the middle. And that is individual rights on the one hand versus the necessity for public order on the other hand. So some people believe that our individual rights should trump everything. That's my personal freedoms, my civil rights, that should come first. Some people say, no, 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 we're gonna take away some of those rights because the interest in the safety of society is takes precedence over your individual rights. You know, right after 9-11, everything at airports changed because, you know, all those guys went through security at airports. They all got on the planes and they, they had, you know, box cutters and, and stuff with them. Well, right after that, oh my gosh, everything was such a hassle to get on a plane because they, 
basically stopped everybody to make sure they were searching. Well, why were they doing that? Yeah, it might've impinged on my individual rights to have to go through such an extensive search and so much time and all that. It was the necessity for public safety because at that point, they didn't want another plane being taken and used as a weapon. And that's a balance all the time. So you will hear that throughout the course. And especially if you read your book and read through the book, just remember those two perspectives, the individual rights perspective versus the public order, public safety perspective. So what is justice? What does that mean, justice? Well, justice is just fairness, right? It's being fair. It's, it's moral equity, meaning everything's fair, but there are justice in separate fields. And one of those is social justice. And that's kind of everything, everything that has to do with, with our lives. It's just kind of a um, fairness, right and wrong thing, just fundamental notions of, of right and wrong. Civil justice is a component of that. Criminal justice is another component of that. Civil justice is um, fairness in relationships between citizens, government agencies, and businesses and private matters. Um, you know, it's citizens to government, um, government agencies who are regulating businesses, business to business and private dealings, private rights out there, that's civil justice. We're, we're gonna be looking at is criminal justice, which means social justice, right? That's over the top of all of it, which is this basic fairness, um, but we're gonna be looking at it in the realm of criminal law. So we, what criminal justice is, it's looking for truth in action within the process of the administration of justice. Are we administering justice fairly? Due process is a term that you hear all the time. You, you can't hardly turn on anything that talks about um, a criminal proceeding or anytime you talk about police work, but I wouldn't give in my due process. Well, due process is just Fairness, it's procedural fairness. Are we following the rules the way they should be followed? They're required by our US Constitution, which does recognize individual rights of criminal defendants. And you're, we're gonna talk about, most of you, if I said, what do you know about the rights of a criminal defendant? Oh, I know they read them their rights when they arrest them. And almost everybody I've ever taught apparently has watched enough police TV shows to say you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. Well, that's that's reading the individual their rights, their Miranda rights, which we're, you're going to learn in a couple of weeks. What's Miranda? Where did that come from? Um, and if you don't follow these rights, and these could be rights even for searches and for seizures, you know, it was an illegal search when they came in. So if they don't follow these rights and, and they don't follow these rules and they violate these rights, that may end up doing away with the evidence or the charges. If you don't follow the rules, you don't get to proceed going after the bad guy. So we're going to specifically talk about the Bill of Rights, which, of course, is going to have it's the 5th, 6th, and 14th are your biggest amendments. The ones you hear on TV all the time is the second, because that's the right to bear arms. So that gets you down the road to the whole gun argument. That another hot topic. Um, now, there are two models of the criminal justice system. So if you only walk away from this class learning one thing, it better be this. There are three components of the criminal justice system. And this doesn't take a rocket science to figure out because how do you get started in the criminal justice system? The police, right? The police usually conduct an investigation and make the arrest. And once you're arrested, you're going to go to court and figure out, well, did you do it or did you not do it? Are you guilty or not? So we've got the police, the courts, and if you're found guilty, you're going to jail. That's the three components, okay? There are two models of how these components work together. The first one is the consensus model. Now, consensus means, do we have an agreement? Consensus means, are, are we all in this together? And so the consensus model says that these three criminal justice system components work together. They cooperate, you move from one end to the next. The problem is that that's not always quite the case. Um, it seems to imply a lot more organization 
from police to courts to jails um, and probably a lot more cooperation than actually exists. I can tell you that, yeah, there's obviously police have to come to my judges to get warrants, um, but there's not, they're not over in the back talking about how to work the case. And the judges aren't involved in that point. They wait until the police present something to them. So it may imply that they all work together, that they're actually cooperating a lot more than what you think. The other um, model is that, no, actually, these are not, they're not working together. They're not cooperating and doing this all as a cohesive unit. They're actually could be in conflict. And it's kind of like when you're in elementary school and you you, you learn the, um, the branches of government and how they kind of check each other, you know, the legislative and the judicial and the executive and how each has different powers and it's a checks and balances. Well, that's what they're kind of saying for the police, the courts, the jails. No, really the conflict model is what's going on. They're doing what they're doing because it's self-serving, not because they're working with another you know, the other part of the the mod of the criminal justice system. And I'll be honest, the, the best example of this I saw, and I, I think it's in the book, it was in the old edition, I assume it's in this one. Um, they tell a story of, there was a bunch of burglaries, I don't remember what town they talked about. Um, and they found the guy, they caught a guy for one of the burglaries, and there were like 400 unsolved burglaries in this town. So the police come in and say, well, if you plead to all these, We'll go to the judge on your behalf and ask for leniency. Well, why did the police want him to do that? Because oftentimes the success rate of a police department is based on how many crimes are solved by that police department. So if this gentleman took responsibility for 400 burglaries, he just knocked out a chunk of, oh, they all became solved now. Well, the court's job is to determine true guilt. In other words, that's a fair trial and to truly determine whether the person is guilty or not. They don't have any interest in him taking a plea to 400 other burglaries. So just kind of an example to show that the parts may not necessarily be working together, nor could they necessarily be trying to achieve the same thing. So that's called the conflict model. So here we go, just as a reminder, if I could emblazon this one somewhere on you, the components of the American justice system, the police who enforce the laws, the courts who conduct the fair and impartial trials and corrections or jails, whichever word you wanna use, who carry out the sentences imposed by the court. Police, courts, jails, or police, courts, corrections, whichever one you're more comfortable with. That will be on every test you take. Okay, so let's look at them individually. What do the police do? Well, they enforce the law, right? We know that. If you're, if you're breaking the law, they're the ones that are going to arrest you for breaking the law. Um, if crimes occur and nobody knows who did the crime, they're the ones that go out investigate and investigate that crime. They are trying to reduce and prevent crimes from ever happening. You know, they're trying to... Um, put measures in place that that stop the burglaries or the murders or, you know, from ever happening in the first place. They're there to maintain public order and ensure community safety. So that's going to be why you see them involved in, you know, big gatherings, even so much as you'll see them at high school football games. You'll see them at some of the fairs and festivals. They're out there maintaining public order and ensuring community safety. So that's the job of the police. Um, Oh, God dang it. I went too far. Let me go back one. So let's go to the courts. So the court's jobs are to conduct fair trials, make sure that due process, remember the procedural fairness, is being adhered to in that court. The court's job is to determine guilt. Did he commit the crime or did he not commit the crime? And if he committed the crime, then the court imposes the sentence the court decides what the punishment is for that. So that's the job of the courts. The courts also um, define rights. 
So rights are open to interpretation. In other words, if you go get out the U.S. Constitution and you read through it, it's not going to say any very specific things. Let's give the let's give the um, the example of abortion. Everybody knows that abortion is a hot topic, right? For the next election coming up, um, abortions were legal, and then recently the Supreme Court, um, with the new justices on it, issued a ruling that said no, they're not. They're not legal. Well, why is it such a, is it or isn't it that the Supreme Court, if it's in the constitution, well, here's the problem. If you go read your constitution, it's not gonna say abortions are okay or are not okay. It's gonna be more of a broad general sentence and they're interpreting how that issue falls under that sentence. So there are a lot of, um, there's a lot of room for interpretation. Well, of course, interpretation can be affected by your personal beliefs. So if one of our justices comes way from the right-hand side who's very anti-abortion, they're probably going to say that right doesn't exist under that language in the Constitution. And of course, if you have one who leans more to the left, who does believe that it's a woman's right to decide, then they're probably going to interpret that same line of the Constitution to say, oh, yes, it is okay. It is legal. So that is, you know, the court's role in defining the rights. A lot of the modern rights that we have would not exist if the Supreme Court had not come through in specific cases and recognized them. And that just means if you read the Constitution, it is very broad in general. You know, you have the right to individual liberty. Well, what does that mean? What can you and can't you do? Cases come to the Supreme Court where somebody did something or didn't do something and they decide whether it correctly fit under that broad language of the Constitution. And once they render a decision, it can carry just as much weight as legislation. So it's, it's basically judge-made law. So the courts have a lot, of, a lot of say in this. And of course, the jails, theirs is a little easier. They get the person once the person has been sentenced. Now, we will run out of time before we can study jails very, very for very long. I mean, we're just going to touch on it and some of the basic um, systems. But there's even a lot of disagreement over how a jail should be carrying out a sentence. You know, some, some jails, you have jails, you have prisons. Some jails don't have anything available for the inmates. They don't have any classes. They don't have any training. They don't have any activities. Um, normally, local jails, like our... The one over in Donaldsonville, that's just the Ascension Parish Jail. You know, that's a local jail. It was initially built simply for the purpose of holding someone until their trial. They weren't really built to take somebody after their trial to serve their sentence. At that point, they were. it was designed that they would go off to the Department of Corrections and go to Angola or some of those other state prisons. And those do have a lot of activities and things, you know, to teach inmates and train them in different vocations and all. Okay, we're going to basically touch on the steps of a criminal case. Um, later on, we're going to go much more detail, but there is a chart. It kind of runs along the bottom of the page in my book, it's on page 14 and 15 and actually rolls on over to 16 at the bottom. And these are the steps of the um, a criminal case. And, and again, we're just kind of touching on them to understand from beginning to end. But we're going we're gonna to go through these more specifically when we get to the, uh, the court proceedings. So most of, most of our cases start with an investigation. In other words, most crimes, we're not, the police aren't there to watch the crime occur and arrest the person that moment, right? We don't, we don't know who did it. I come home, somebody stole something away from my house, I call the police, they have to conduct an investigation. So that is the start of most of the cases. So they conduct their investigation and they think they have the person, they have enough evidence to prove that person did it. So they wanna make an arrest. And the arrest of course is taking that person into custody. Normally they will go to a judge first and say, judge, 
here's all the evidence I have found. I would like to arrest this person. So they go get a warrant signed for the arrest. And they can do that because they're in an investigation, right? If I'm, if the police officer's out there and sees you commit the crime, they don't have to have an arrest warrant. If they watch you, they can just get you. But if they've conducted this investigation, then it's kind of a, you know, double check in. Let me put it before a judge and make sure we have enough and they'll issue the arrest warrant. And of course, once they're arrested, before they start questioning them, they will issue the Miranda warnings. And that's the one we talked about. You know, you have the right to remain silent. And they'll, they'll do that. And we'll learn about Mr. Miranda's case. OK, so they've come to your home. They've picked you up. They've arrested you. They've put you in the back of the car and they're driving you over to the jail. Now what they're going to do is book you into the jail. And the booking is just the administrative procedure. You most of the time, in fact, they, I heard him talking today about Trump on this new indictment is going to have to go to Georgia and he's actually has to be booked and they're going to take his fingerprints and take a mug shot. Um, we used to take a um, when when every before the virus, um, I would bring my class to the jail and um, some of the the warden, assistant warden and you know, a couple of guys would give us a tour of the jail and we'd always start up in the front at the office. But the first place we'd go is booking. This is where we take their picture. We log in all their property. If you have watches or wallets or rings or whatever, you know, that's all logged in. They issue you your pretty little orange jumpsuit at that point and pack your clothes away. So that's the booking and that's being um, processed into the jail. So now you're in jail. And what they're going to do is, it, 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 this is where it varies a little bit from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, meaning that I'm going to kind of tell you what we do, but generically speaking, you have a first appearance. Um, here in our district, that first appearance is, is not really for bail. The judges will get the information on the arrest to set bail um, by paper. They do it by paperwork. If they want to have a bail hearing, they'll go ahead and schedule a bail hearing. But they will make sure they have an attorney appointed if they're still in jail before 72 hours passes. So you do have to have an um, attorney appointed. But in any event, different jurisdictions. That's why sometimes when you see the real bad guy arrested on some crime that we all heard about, you know, all over the nation, they show him appearing in court the very next morning. Well, that's his first appearance. Their judges set bail at that appearance, probably appoint his um you know, the if you cannot afford an attorney, one will be appointed to represent you. That's a public defender. So ours do a lot of that work just via Zoom to the jail instead of making those inmates come over. Um, the virus really affected that a lot. But they they appoint and, and only if they feel like they need more information on what the bail should be, will they actually schedule a hearing in court. Um, then there's a preliminary hearing or a preliminary exam. And this can be requested by the defendant and the, the state or the prosecutor has to establish probable cause to proceed with the case. So they have to present enough evidence to convince the judge that they do have probable cause to move forward with the case. The defendant doesn't have to say anything, but what the defendant gets to do is listen to the witness that the prosecutor and most of the time it is just the police officer who made the arrest. He gets up there and testifies as to what he found and why he arrested that person. So it's a very easy standard normally to reach, but it is called a preliminary hearing or a preliminary exam. Formal charges, meaning you have been charged with on this date doing this thing, that's brought about by either what we call a bill of information, which is just a typed up piece of paper the district attorney does that says on such and such a date, you did so and so. Or it's a grand jury indictment. And we'll talk a little bit more about grand juries. That's actual normal people like you and me who serve around here. They serve for six months. The DA brings cases before them. It's not conducted like a jury trial, like a regular jury. And that will be a question on test throughout this semester. Is a grand jury conducted just like a regular jury? No, not at all. The grand jury is only the prosecutor putting on the evidence saying, do you think there's enough to move forward? And then an arraignment. Arraignment is when they formally bring the defendant in and say, you have been charged with this. How do you plead guilty or not guilty? And so most people say not guilty because they want to negotiate a deal, but you can plead either one guilty or not guilty. Every defendant 
Okay, so we're moving, I'm sorry, we're moving on to the next step because we've been to the arraignment and now your trial has set. And the fancy word for trial is adjudication. But every defendant has the right to a trial by jury. That's the Sixth Amendment. That's not true for petty offenses. You're not going to get to go in and have a jury trial for your speeding ticket, you know, or for your pickpocket or, you know, the little things. However, anything else, you, you have the right to a trial by jury. All felonies, clearly, you have the right. Very few of them actually go to trial because most cases are dealt with through what's called plea bargaining. Hey, I'll lower the charges to this if you agree to plead guilty. So it's a deal that's cut between the prosecution and the defendant. The defendant can waive his right to a jury trial and say, I don't want a jury, I want the judge to decide. That's called a bench trial. But the defendant is the only one that can do it. So the prosecutor who has to prove that you're guilty, it's not their right to do it. Only the one who's been charged with the crime can come in and say, I don't want a jury, I want a judge. Well, why would somebody ever do that? Well, I'll tell you, we had a case here that I thought was gonna get to that point. Several years back, we had a local politician who got charged with paying off somebody else to drop out of the race he was in. And it was a big local deal. And they had a tape of him handing the money over, that kind of thing. And he was charged um, with whatever the formal crime is of bribing a candidate, basically. Well, his defense came in and said, hold up. That guy that we paid the money to he didn't live in the right district to really be a candidate for the office that he had signed up for. So legally, he doesn't fit the definition of candidate. So therefore, we didn't pay money to a candidate. Now, that's a very legal-minded definition. It's not, you know, they got a tape of the guy handing the money over. So if if you go to lay people who don't know the law, who just think, golly, they got him handing the money over, you're guilty. Mm -mm, That's not what I want. I want that judge who's a lawyer, who knows the law, who understands that every aspect of that statute has to be met. So that's just an example. If you have a complicated legal defense, you may want to stick with a judge instead of a jury because they're not lawyers. They're regular people like me and you. Finally, after the trial, there's a sentencing. In Louisiana, our judge imposes the sentence. We do here in other states. Sometimes if you follow any of the big trials that go on um, in some other states, the jury decides the sentence. They'll come back for the sentencing phase. But here the judge does it. Um, That sentence might be some type of probation, either supervised or unsupervised. It might involve a fine where he has to pay money, maybe restitution to the victim if if he's taken money from the victim. Could be prison term or it could be a combination of, of any or all of those. The judge gets a report that's put together by the probation and parole office It's called a pre-sentence report to give them some information. And that pre-sentencing report is going to have, it's basically, they go and kind of summarize this defendant's life. You know, it's looking for um, factors that might make this situation worse. Maybe he has an extensive criminal record. Um, Maybe he's committed a lot of crimes of violence. You know, the judge needs to know that because that's more likely to get a longer sentence. Um, Maybe he had a terrible childhood and he was you know, abused. And and so maybe that tugs at the judge's heart to say, well, you know, he never really had a chance. Maybe I give him a lesser sentence, whatever the factors are. It all goes into that pre-sentencing report for the judge to try to weigh all of those factors to determine the sentence. Um, Okay. So the judge, the judge may have before him convictions on multiple crimes. So you were charged with three different crimes and you were found guilty of all three Well, you get a sentence on all three. So let's say that your first crime, you got, you got, you're going to have to serve one year. Your second crime, you're going to have to serve two years. And your third crime, you're going to have to serve three years. So those sentences can either run consecutively, which means one after the other, which means you got to do year one. And then on your second one would be year two and year three. 
And then your third one would be year four, five, and six. So that's actually six years if they're one after the other. If they're concurrent, that means we're going to stack them on top of each other. And year one covers your, obviously crime one is done. It covers the first year of the two-year sentence and it covers the first year of the three-year sentence. So if they're running concurrently stacked on top of each other, you're only doing a total of three years. So you do need to know consecutive versus concurrent sentences. And obviously all um, convictions can be appealed, which means we're gonna learn when we get to the section on courts in about two or three weeks, we're gonna learn that you know courts, you can appeal from a lower court to a higher court to have them look over the decision that was made in the court underneath them. And finally, the correction stage, and that begins after the sentencing, and you're gonna you know, put this person in prison. They are classified as the type of prisoner. They're assigned to a particular prison. They may be given treatment programs, drug programs, you know, things like that. Um, there are still problems. A lot of people would tell you with what we do with our inmates when they're in there. Um, what people forget is that most of those people that are in jail are going to come back out and be among us. Um, most of them are not going to be in there for life. So if we're not doing anything to help them or improve their ability when they get out to make a living and survive without committing crime, we really haven't served ourselves either. Um, so there's a lot, you could spend a whole semester studying prisons and how they're set up and what we should be doing and how other countries do it and all that. But that's the correction stage and it begins after sentencing. And like I said, most of those people who are in prison are going to come back out into society and that's called re-entry. And, you know, sometimes they're on probation, sometimes they're involved in um, community service activities. You know, there still may be some, some things they have to do, but they're actually out in the community. And some of them may be freed on parole. Parole and probation are often um, confused for each other. And um, we're going to, that's almost one of the last things we get to in, in week six or seven, um, the difference for you to understand the difference but there is a parole officer assigned to make sure if that person is released on their sentence that they are doing the basics that you would want somebody to do, meaning, you know, maintain a residence, get a job, remain crime free. You know, the, the basics, they usually have a fee they have to pay to for the, you know, for the service of being on parole and having a parole officer. So that's called reentry. So if you look across the bottom of pages 14, 15, and 16. And I, I have, again, I haven't seen the ebook. I have a real book, so I may not be giving you the right page numbers. Okay, so that is chapter one in a nutshell. I'm going to do a separate taped lecture for chapter two, uh, but we do both chapters this week. So you'll be seeing both of these go up in that module. You have review questions to do, and those are simply a set of questions that. Um, hit the main topics. It's usually anywhere from 10 to 20 points. I don't have it in front of me right here as to how much um, this particular set is. Um, it looks like these may be worth 20 points. So this is a big uh, group of chapter one review questions. Um, you will also have a set after chapter two once you do the chapter two lecture. So please keep up with those review questions. You have two attempts and getting them right. They are normally straight from the PowerPoints too, because remember the PowerPoints are the key points. So there's no reason not to get all your review questions right. You have two attempts at getting the right answer. So it's gonna tell you if you missed it the first time. But those points will add up to, I think it was 110 points thereabouts for your for the semester, for the eight weeks, sorry, half a semester. Um, so that can make a difference in your grade and there's really no reason to not do it. Plus, why do you think they're on there as review questions? because you're going to see them again. And that means you're gonna see them on a test. All right, so we jumped in, we knocked out chapter one. Um, I'm gonna have chapter two up pretty quickly, but I'm ready to roll. Um, you can reach me. I have one, somebody who's already reached out to me having trouble getting the ebook. We're gonna solve all those problems. It's okay if you're having trouble. I'm giving you the PowerPoint. I'm giving you the video. 
you're going to be fine if you don't get the book, you know, the first day out, we're still going to be able to, um, to you're still going to be able to get everything you need.